Good morning, dear respected Thai, dear beloved community. This morning we uh, will have an opportunity for a session of question and answer. Up here we have uh, four brothers and sisters, Brother Bao Dang, uh, Sister True Dedication, uh, Sister Harmony, and myself. We will um, have an opportunity to ask questions of the practice, questions that concerns our happiness and our suffering. And we try not to be so uh, intellectual in our question. And uh, none of us, we have uh, the full answer, but we have experience in our practice that we can offer a sharing regarding um, the question. And a good question can benefit many, many friends who are here. And a good question doesn't have to be long. And we only have one chance to ask one question because we have so many of us that is here. And uh, to start, we have the children. It's a great joy to have them here. So we will, at the beginning, offer space for the children to ask a question about uh, four questions. And we know there's a big body of children, but each children also have their monks and nuns of their program, so they can also continue to ask questions to the monastics afterwards. But sometimes the children ask the most deepest question and the most practical question, so it can also be a benefit for all of us. And we have um, the translation that is also set up uh, for us to, to hear if we don't understand in English, but if we, um, or if we need translation, we can also bring somebody to help us translate the question. And because um, if we are shy, we can always write down our question and pass them through the crowd up to the bell master, and the bell master will give it to us. And um, we will try our best in the capacity of, um, that we have, as well as the time, so that we can answer the question. So that is this morning's session. So our practice before we start is whenever we have a question, we will invite you to come up and sit, sit up here. There's a chair that is ready, and you can have the view like we have up here to see everyone. <laughs> and then we'll listen to a sound of the bell and to breathe mindfully, to feel our heart rate ease down and then we can ask our question. So that is what we have this morning. So let us uh, begin. So if there is any child that has a question, you are welcome to come up. So we'll listen to a sound of the bell so we can breathe together. Come back to your breathing. Est-ce que les terroristes, à un moment dans leur vie, ils ont une âme d'enfant So the question is, um, if um, is the terrorist have a soul of a child at some point in their life? Is a soul of a child? So the question is, we check we've understood the question. Does a terrorist, at some moment in their life, do they have the, the soul, am, lam, lam? The soul of a child, um, meaning in, in their heart? Yes. 
Does a terrorist have a soul of a child in their heart at some point? Good question. We will breathe a moment. Thank you for this question. I think when we think of a child and the soul of a child, we think of someone who loves life, uh, someone who loves their parents, uh, someone who loves to run around and enjoy nature. Um, and I think that every human being, every person has a child inside. Every person wants to enjoy life. Every person wants their family to be safe. And um, I think that when we think of a terrorist, we think of someone who wants to do harm and, and violence, right? Someone who wants to punish. And sometimes we think of it as someone who wants to take revenge, right? And I think a terrorist has that mind of wanting to attack because they feel scared. They feel that their way of life is in danger. They feel maybe their country is in danger or their culture, things they, that are really um, important to them, they feel are in danger. And that is from that fear comes the wish to attack and to punish. Maybe in the heart of a terrorist, they, they feel that the, the danger to them and to their family is bigger than the violence that they do. You see, so they they are trying to they are trying to stop people to doing harm to their own culture. So when we think about ourselves, who are not terrorists yet, <laughs> we want to really be aware when we feel scared or we feel threatened. How do we act? How do we respond? So when other children, for example, do harm to us, or other people at work or in our environment do harm to us, and we feel threatened, how do we respond? And the idea is that we would like to respond with courage and with compassion and not with fear, because the more afraid we are, the more violent we may be, because we think, if you will attack me, I will attack you first. If you attack me, I'm going to attack you first. That is the mind of a, of a terrorist. So for us, if we want to follow a path of non-violence, a path of peace and not killing, it means that when we feel hurt by someone, the first thing we want to do is not react but take care of our painful feeling. And that's why this week we've all been learning how to breathe, how to come back to our breathing, how to feel a strong emotion and calm it with our breathing. And that means that we don't respond with violence, we don't try and punish, but we try and see the situation a bit more clearly. So if a child, if all of you here on this retreat can take care of your anger and learn not to be violent and not to attack each other, then we know it is possible also for a terrorist to have that same insight that the, if we create violence, if we respond to violence with violence, right, we have more violence. If we respond to violence with compassion and peace, we will have less violence in the world. So each of us, our challenge is to see 
how with my brothers and sisters, with my friends, how at school, how can I be the, the element which is helping to reduce the violence and not the element that is introducing more violence? So I think in the heart of each terrorist, they have love. They want to protect life. They want to protect their culture. They just don't know how. They don't know how to do it uh, in a peaceful way. But for us, we're starting to learn how to handle situations with a peaceful way. And if you can do this, then you can grow up to be someone that can help people who feel afraid not be violent. And you can be someone who can help do that. Do you think you can? Can you help people who feel afraid not be violent? <laughs> Maybe. It's a big job. But you won't do it alone because you have a lot of friends who will help you. Thank you very much for your question. Maybe you sit, you, you can sit, I add a little bit more. We are in Europe, and it's, it's quite difficult for us to imagine on all the continents that there's children who never have a chance to go to school, who don't have food to eat. And so when they grow up, um, they don't have anything. And so if someone teach them about something, and they believe in it, and they can kill and can die for it. And so if we can share our resources with children on all parts of the world so that they also have a chance to go to school to learn, then they don't have to become terrorists. We'll listen to the sound of the bell first. Come back to your breathing. You think that Greek, Greek myths um, are accurate? I just want to know. So the question is, do we think that Greek myths, Greek myths, the ancient stories and myths of the Greeks are accurate? Or at least a bit true. Or at least a little bit true. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem? So why, so why don't you tell us your, uh, your favorite character or story that you wish was true? Um, uh, I don't know. They're all good, I guess. Um, like everyone equally. I like every myth that I know equally. My thing, my favorite one is uh, the Minotaur and the Ten Trials of of Hercules. So stories about the Minotaur yeah. and Hercules. Yeah, I, I, I did too. I think this is out of the monastic realm. Oh, okay. And uh, then... Uh, 
Can two monks get married? Ooh. That's a good <laughs> oh, Can the monks get married? Two monks. That's in our realm. Uh, two monks. Yeah. Can two monks get married <laughs> I to meant each other? One monk get married, but like one, one monk can get married from another. Yeah. Thank you. Like a monk can. Uh, okay, uh, we're gonna answer now. You can put the mic down. Is that okay? So a very clear answer is when we become monastic, monks or nuns, we don't get married to an individual person. But we have a kind of commitment also when we are joining the monastic life. And our commitment is to the path of nonviolence, the path of understanding, and the path of community building in our tradition. So sometimes an ordination, a novice ordination, if you ever had a chance to see it, it's almost like a wedding. But we are not marrying one individual person, but we are marrying our path. We are committing our whole life to the path of spirituality and we do, we do live a life of um, non-romantic love but our love we turn it into four elements of love if you think that the monastics don't love that's wrong our life is not that dry <laughs> we um, we learn to have kindness, we learn to have compassion, grow our compassion, we learn to grow our joy, and we learn to grow our non-discrimination, to be more and more open, so our love can embrace not just one person, but everyone. So we don't marry one individual person and we don't have sexual relationships. And you, 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 we won't have children, biological children, but we will have students. We can have many, many students. You know, our teacher, he has many, many students. I have around 700 or 800 brothers and sisters. So when we marry the Sangha, it's more of a practice because I need to get to know my 800 brothers and sisters. <laughs> and, and it's a real, real practice because every day we get to learn more and more about each other. And we learn to live in harmony. And that is an element of love, harmony. And harmony doesn't mean we all get along right away, but we learn to accept each other. We even accept the ugliness in each other. You know, you know, in the monks resident, we have around 40 monks, and all of us, we are from different background, different education, different culture, and we all share room together. Do you think we're happy all the time? <laughs> Sometimes we look at each other and I'm breathing very deeply. Breathing in, he is still a flower. <laughs> Breathing out, I need to be calm like water. <laughs> but you know, it's very much like a, in like a relationship, right? So for us, when we, when we become a monastic, we, uh, we also learn to love. But our love can become bigger and bigger and boundless so that we can learn to have understanding and to have compassion. And that is a lifetime journey. So we also marry, but we marry a path. Okay? Thank you. No, only one question. 
thank you. Perché i monaci hanno sempre una tunica e d'estate non hanno dei vestiti più leggeri da indossare? So, uh, the question is why the monastics they always wear a long robe and in the summer they don't have uh, more light clothes to, to wear. Dear Thai, dear community and dear friend, <coughs> at the beginning I also feel suffer with the long rope in the summer. <laughs> and now I enjoy wearing long rope in the summer. It is because I have aspiration. The aspiration of loving myself and also the aspiration of loving other people and this rope is very precious to me and I don't want to change it with another thing and uh, so when I wear this rope I have to remind myself that um, I have a chance I have an opportunity to understand myself better and to also to understand other people. And wearing, wearing the robe is not only being for clothes, but it's also for us to practice in monastic life. And I always uh, make joke with another brothers. I share that sometimes your aspiration can reduce the temperature of your body. So when you wear the robe with aspiration, your body temperature is going down. <laughs> so that's how I, I practice. And, um, and this is very precious. And, and this is also a reminder for all the monastic. Every time we wear this robe, we remind ourselves that we are a practitioner and we have aspiration and we have... Uh, you know, cultivation of what our brother just shared. We cultivate everyday love, compassion, joy, and equanimity and inclusiveness. Yeah, so this is why we still wear the long robe in the summer, even if it is very hot. But we continue to explore how to change our robe also. And we are not get caught in only this. We are trying to find if any, any other ways that can make us much more comfortable. Year by year, we try to find, uh, explore the color, explore the, the material so that we can be more comfortable. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your care for the monastic. <laughs> Last question for the children. Why do sisters and brothers shave their head? <laughs> mm. 
Don't you think in this heat with our hair would feel better? <laughs> we enjoy very much. You know, we can perspire easily, you know, and, and, and and heat not trap in our hair and in our head. Um, but some of us still um, uh, feel very hot, you know, in the brow. So we have another. So we, that's how shaving hair it will go with brow rope. So so in summer we can cope with it. Um, We shave hair because we want to change our appearance. Like Brother Bao Tang said, because we have an aspiration. Not only we want to, um, to practice, but we want also to look differently. And this different form will remind us of our aspiration, that we are monastic. We choose this life, this way of life, to practice so that we can um, open our center and welcome all of you to come and practice with us right now. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, dear children. So with the next sound of the small bell, you all can stand up and then turn towards the community and then bow to the whole sangha that is here and then go with your program. <laughs> 